So welcome to the sustainable sustainability speaker series. My name is Joe. I am a librarian here at Saskatoon Public Library. Uh, to begin with for tonight, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis and uh, our presenters today, Greg and Ryan are in Regina, which is on Treaty 4 territory and also the homeland of the Métis. We are all treaty people. Um, before I hand things over to Katya, I would just like to mention that if you are interested in any other Saskatoon Public Library programs, uh, most of them, all of them are still virtual uh, for the spring. If you're interested in any of them, uh, for instance, the One Book, One Province program that's coming up on March 7th, uh, information for those are all on our website under uh, what's happening in programs. Um, there's the PDF uh, program guide, as well as the program calendar, which will have everything listed. Um, that One Book, One Province program will be listed in the next few days. Uh, and with that, I am going to hand things over to Katya Godova from the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Uh, and here she is. There you go. Okay. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sustainability Speaker Series. Um, before I begin uh, with introducing our speakers, uh, I want to say a few words about Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The Saskatchewan Environmental Society has been operating for over 50 years on important issues uh, and very diverse projects such as sustainable energy, climate solutions, water protection, resources conservation, forestry, preservation of biodiversity, and many others. If you aren't already a member, I encourage you to join SES. You can always find out more about our diverse projects, activities, and how to get involved um, by checking out our website at uh, www.environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive email notifications uh, of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series, you can send an email to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The address is uh, info at environmentalsociety.ca. In your email, please ask uh, to be put on the list of people to be notified about events in Sustainability Speaker Series. So our speakers for today are Greg Kantz and Ryan Gray. Uh, Greg has accepted the position of a manager of energy and sustainability solutions with the city of Regina in November of 2020. Uh, he has been tasked with overseeing the completion of an energy and sustainability framework that guides the municipal government and community on a path to becoming net zero and 100% renewable by 2050. Greg joined uh, the city in 2015 as a manager of the environmental services branch, where he oversaw regulatory activities related to air, water, wastewater, and solid waste. Prior to his time with the city, Greg worked uh, for consulting companies for 14 years working on um, contaminated sites, assessing water resources, and designing waste management systems. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Ryan Gray. Ryan is a strategy and performance consultant working under Greg Kanz in the Energy and Sustainability Solutions branch, City of Regina. Uh, Ryan also started at the city in 2000. 15, uh, but prior to this current role, he had been working in the city's centralized public policy and performance measurement branches. 
Before working for the city, Ryan was a student at the Johnson Shiyama Graduate School of Public Policy, University of Regina, where he earned uh, his master's of public administration. Uh, the title of their presentation today is Regina's Energy and Sustainability Framework. So please join me in welcoming Greg and Ryan. Hello. Uh, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Uh, cool. Okay. I can't see, but I'm assuming people can hear me and see my screen. So I'll get started. Uh, hey, Ryan, just one second. Yeah. Uh, I think we can probably see your notes here. Um, you might have to click something just to go presentation mode. Um, we're good here now, if you're good. Uh, and now what? So you're just on the title screen. We got the, we can see the title screen on it. You're on agenda now, so we're good. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I guess in the, in the hour that we have, we're gonna talk pretty holistically about uh, basically our, our, the last year, year and a bit of, uh, of our lives, I guess, and our work. Um, starting with the background of the project, uh, kind of, like why it all came to be um, and start talking about the development process. So how we, how we went through actually developing our, our energy and sustainability framework. And then some of those key pieces that are part of it, the, what we call the business is planned scenario, the low carbon pathway, um, the financial modeling that we, that we did or some info about the modeling that we did and then some next steps and then yeah, open to questions from, from people that are listening. So uh, I guess to start, uh, we really kind of, the groundwork was pretty influential. So it was, the goal was really to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions and sourcing net zero energy from renewable sources for the, for the community of Regina by 2050. Um, and that was pretty important to just really emphasize that it was the entire city. Uh, some cities have similar plans or have similar approaches, but they focus only on maybe their corporate operations rather than the, the entire kind of community. So that was, uh, that was our scope, was, was trying to address the, the entire city of Regina. Uh, I'm assuming given kind of the topic and the, the, the folks that might be part of this, it might go without saying, but um, kind of the, the background to the background of why this is all happening is, um, you know, it's a climate mitigation kind of strategy or, or plan or, or a, a plan to address climate change. So um, really we want to curb emissions uh, in line with, with everything that happened with the Paris Agreement in December of 2015 during uh, COP21. So 196 countries all signed the Paris Agreement. Signatories uh, essentially became legally bound to this international treaty on climate change. And with that was the uh, agreement to limit global warming to well below two degrees Celsius and preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels. Um, that's not really been adhered to at all. So based on current modeling, uh, the, the projections are that we are as a world on a path to hit uh, three degrees of warming. So definitely way beyond uh, where we would want to be for the ecosystem, for the planetary health as a whole. Uh, and I guess more locally, Canada is committed to re reducing its greenhouse gas by 45% below 2005 levels by 2030. Um, and then of note, Canada has not reached any of its pre previous climate targets and uh, it has one of the highest levels of GHG emissions per capita in the world. So uh, obviously there's other countries that have a larger, you know, absolute number of, of emissions, but yeah, in terms of per capita, uh, we are one of the highest. And then if you look at Saskatchewan, we are one of the highest within Canada. So definitely uh, a good reason to 
to try to push forward and make some effort towards this initiative. Uh, again, so kind of going back to the very beginning, council's direct direction kind of started in 2018. City Council voted unanimously for Regina to become 100% renewable energy uh, community by 2050. Uh, so really focusing on renewable energy for transportation, heating and cooling and power. Uh, it kind of was identified throughout the process and, and it kind of early on in the process that you know, to do that effectively meant uh, having a, a broader approach towards conserving energy, improving energy efficiency, and then focusing on adding renewable energy uh, after, or I mean, simultaneously, but those two kind of conserving and improving were really, are really like foundational, given that it helps minimize the amount of renewable energy we have to, you know, infrastructure we have to create. And so all of that together helps us minimize costs, maximize benefits, both financially and then for, for the community as a whole. Uh, kind of talked about the Paris Agreement in 2015. And so just kind of, the whole idea here is that everything should really be like flowing or our, our perspective or our kind of approach was that we should be kind of taking best practice uh, and really basing our, our framework or the, the method that we use for determining what we should be doing really like stemming from, you know, international best practice. So trying to be as much as we can in, aligned to the Paris Agreement and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so, yeah. Canada has its pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change. And uh, they have their, Canada has their net zero future strategy. And so everything is really trying to be aligned to that. Um, so specifically the framework development process itself, we kind of talk about it in a six step, uh, yeah, six step process. So the preparation phase was, was understanding local context in Regina and collecting local data. Uh, demographic data, um, you know, a lot of systems data that we have internally at the city of Regina from like traffic data, uh, energy and consumption data, and then also reaching out to, you know, some external partners, the crown corporations like energy and power. Um, and this was also when we onboarded, we had a consulting firm that, that worked with us. They were uh, the sustainability solutions group, SSG. Uh, they're one of like Canada's, you know, I would say top um, climate planning firms. And so they came on board to help uh, build the framework with us. And so again, at that time, it was their opportunity to really get uh, acquainted with, with Regina specific context. So then the next step was uh, inventory phase. So really that was about conducting baseline energy use and emissions modeling to understand Regina's current energy and emissions profile. Um, that was basically saying, starting in 2016, taking as much kind of baseline data and particularly 2016, because that was the last uh, census year. So the most accurate uh, demographic data. And then starting from there and, and looking at building out models, which I'll talk about in a bit later on. Um, and then seeing where, you know, what the, the inventory looked like and what that was gonna transform into as we move towards 2050, if we didn't take any action. Uh, the next phase was the target setting phase, uh, basically start, starting with that 2050 net zero goal, along with best practices and energy and emissions planning, uh, again, and then relating to that, I, you know, the IPCC goal of 1.5 degrees or of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We kind of used all of that to identify uh, a preferable, I'd say, target for, for that, would, that would meet Regina's kind of reality, I would say. Um, just yeah, local context to what would be specific to our, our area and what was what was practical and doable. The next phase was actions and scenario planning. Um, that was about developing a set of actions and overall low carbon scenario and taking those actions, timing them and sequencing them so that we could really optimize the best path and, and try to find the, I would say the most optimal path that obviously there's gonna be a lot of financial investment required, but then finding the way to do that, you know, so that you can really get the best return on the investment and see the benefits as soon as possible, uh, and try to be maybe you know a, a leader, either you know nationally, provincially, globally, etc. So really finding the best way to do that. Um, 
after that was is the implementation phase and the monitoring and evaluation phases. Um, I mean, we'll probably touch a bit on that at the end of the presentation, but really that's what comes after all of this. So it's, you know, actually doing the work, putting the, developing the programs and the policies and the initiatives in place to actually achieve the framework and do what is stated in the framework and then uh, monitoring and evaluation. And, and really that's uh, a way of holding the city accountable, holding the community accountable and, and just reporting on progress. So this is a, a pretty busy graphic. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it, it kind of goes over what I talked about, but it really just shows our approach overall from uh, about a six month period. I mean, part of this, it's a static image and I mean, timelines have shifted a bunch, so it's not the most accurate anymore, but it really just shows the, the kind of the, 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 the thought out process of, of making sure that not only were we doing a lot of those things that I mentioned, but we were also overlapping a lot of um, community engagement and stakeholder engagement. Um, yeah, I would note, like we started, um, I would say, I think Greg could, Greg could correct me, but we started late last year towards the end of the year. So, I mean, even though this started in June on this graphic here, this is kind of when all the public facing stuff started to kick off but in the background for you know half of last year we were really just doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes yeah ryan in perspective we were we issued the request for proposal for consultants on the 31st of december 2020 so that's really when the whole process kicked off formally yeah. so yeah uh, that's that was awarded i believe it was in february and then they began all their background um work gathering data to build a build out the base businesses plan model which ryan will tell you about in a bit yeah uh, maybe just a, a quick a bit more about engagement uh the engagement process provided opportunities for interested parties stakeholders the public etc to contribute to the the development of the framework and then also really we try to keep people informed through a, a multiple engagement channels so there was early on we uh, launched a community advisory group is what we called it, the, the CAG, which we probably will reference later on or throughout the presentation. So CAG is our community advisory group. And that was comprised of community wide organizations and sector representatives. Um, and so we really wanted to take members that were chosen that had representation from across different institutions, um, whether that was the industry, businesses, not for profits, our utility partners and indigenous partner organizations. The, uh, the mandate was really there is like, they were there to inform the development of the plan and ensure it reflects uh, community interests. So, um, you know, one of the important things or, you know, a good learning opportunity throughout this whole thing is really trying to navigate having obviously a whole bunch of competing interests or competing uh, ideas, desires, wants of what this would turn into or what this would look like. Um, and so really trying to get all the different voices and uh, not necessarily make sure that they're all represented in the framework, but just make sure that we've at least considered it. Because obviously, you, you know, in some of these things, they're very disparate desires or wants, and we can't accommodate everything, but um, definitely had a pretty broad uh, you know, scope of, of people that were involved. Um, members, so we, we held a bunch of workshops throughout the year. Um, basically, every kind of milestone that I described previously in the presentation, we would have a, a meeting where we'd walk them through our findings, and then we'd kind of take some time to hear their kind of concerns and what they were excited about, uh, things that we should be considering along the way that maybe we weren't thinking about. Um, what else can I say? They, uh, we also, towards the end of, of last year, we ended up having six focus group conversations that included some of those CAG members, uh, as well as other stakeholders from the public. Um, and those were kind of uh, organized along, I would say, like the, the sectors that they represented. So we might have had a bunch of nonprofits and um, people from like the building community, the land use community. Um, people from the environment, you know, environmental advocacy stakeholders. And then we also did one-on-one -on -one interviews. So, um, you know, we obviously have relationships with 
some key, you know, crown, like the crown corporations, um, other kind of stakeholder, one of the, bit, one of the, you know, really important stakeholders on our CAG was federated co-op. So um, I'm not sure if most of the people tuning in are from Saskatoon, but um, within Regina's actual boundaries is an oil refinery. So uh, you can imagine that that has a pretty big impact and, and pretty an, an outsized impact really on Regina's emissions uh, and energy use kind of, um, yeah, picture like it just it's something that was really, I, in terms of numbers, challenging to, to contend with because uh, it's pretty unique across Canada. There is not too many cities that actually have oil refineries. So when it comes to, you know, running numbers and doing modeling, uh, you can't really leave those out or we chose obviously not to leave them out to, to tell a, as accurate a story and paint an accurate picture. Um, but that greatly impacts Regina's ability to become net zero, become renewable, et cetera. Uh, also try to speak a bit more about engagement. We talked uh, to the community with a public uh, public survey. So we had an online survey. We held a, a youth forum where we reached out to a bunch of high schools and gave presentations to uh, a whole bunch of uh, high school classrooms, all virtually, of course. Um, and then we had a, a, um, a public forum as well, where we kind of towards, I would say, fall of last year, we held uh, kind of like an open house uh, virtually or a town hall, maybe where people could kind of hear a presentation, maybe similar to this one and, and ask questions. So we definitely try to hear a lot of voices as much as possible. Uh, it's, it's adds a lot of, of really valuable input, but it's also, you know, a, a big commitment from a time perspective. Uh, and so I think it's, I think we definitely did a, a, a pretty comprehensive engagement uh, piece for this project. I know definitely not all cities have as much engagement involved, but uh, community engagement, I mean, it should be important obviously, but it's, it's a really uh, important to our city council. So it's something that we paid attention to. Um, so the next piece here, talking about businesses plan scenario. So I guess this is kind of like a, a big milestone for the project was, as I mentioned, we, we created an inventory of energy and emissions for the community and for the organization. And then we use that to create a scenario for the future um, or going into the future. And so really we, when we talk about scenarios, we're saying a scenario is an internally consistent view of what the future might turn out to be. So it's not a forecast, it's just one possible future outcome. Um, we took a bunch of data, we made a bunch, we made assumptions about that data, and we you know projected that into the future. Basically, if things remain the same, here's what the future could look like. So it's you know, nobody's saying that this is like definitively what's going to happen. It's it's just a necessary component to kind of baseline and to take all your actions and to compare them against, you know, if we do X, we'll be this much better than the, the business is planned scenario, for example. So a bit more information, um, what is business is planned? So it includes all the plans and policies that are essentially, a, that were approved or underway. So we would say, for example, the federal government has a bunch of, you know, approved targets um, for when, let's say, the National Building Code is supposed to become net zero or net zero ready, or when um, federal government has made statements about uh, personal vehicles needing to be electric by 2035. So those kind of um, statements that were essentially, you know, obviously things can change, but once they're kind of codified or they're actually approved policies, we would include those in the business plan scenario. Um, Obviously, it becomes fuzzy. You can there's a lot of kind of big proclamations that either industry or or governments or other other kind of sources make. So obviously, we don't we we had to be really I think focused and specific on what we included because there's a lot of hypotheticals um, that that are probably too speculative to include or to model. Like we needed raw like actual hard data and numbers to quantify. So. Um, again, proclamations or, or statements that weren't really quantifiable, weren't really something we could include in an actual uh, 
algor algorithmic model. Um, so everything was based on quantitative projections. Um, so we used that baseline that we, we started in 2016. And then what we also did to calibrate that model to make that business's plan scenario as accurate as possible is we essentially said, okay, from 2016 to 2021 or 2020, wherever we had more relevant data that was accurate, not based on the, the projections, we would calibrate that. So we would start in 2016 and we'd, we'd forecast to 2050, but obviously in 27, from 2017, we had real numbers in 2020, 18, 2019, et cetera. So wherever we had real numbers along the way, we would adjust the model to make sure that it was accurate as possible. Um, the other big part of the, the business's plan scenario is the key demographic kind of indicator. So obviously Regina, most cities grow, things change over time. So we, we try to use meaningful projections for population growth, employment growth, um, any kind of things where we had kind of um, historical averages or historical trends where we could kind of look at forecasts and say, well, you know, we've been trending this much growth for this long. So if we assume this type of growth going forward, we could use those population numbers to, to continue to, I guess, refine our model. Um, other key assumptions, they looked at uh, heating degree days, grid carbon intensity, building efficiency, vehicle transport efficiency. So I would say, again, we see heating degree days are declining, grid, grid intensity is declining. So we know that the grid, even though Saskatchewan's grid is relatively fossil fuel dependent, it is getting cleaner. We know that buildings are getting more efficient over time. We know that vehicles are getting more efficient over time. You know, they're moving towards electric vehicles. Buildings are getting more efficient, moving towards net zero. So we're able to use some of those kind of broad trends and use those to help calibrate the model as well. Uh, and sorry, just to, to add in heating degree days are, are the days when you need to heat your home and building. So, uh, yeah. So now we're actually getting into the results. So we have our BAP results here up on the screen. So you'll see that graph is the community emission. So again, for the entire city of Regina, it's our greenhouse gas emissions uh, on the left starting in 2016 and then projected out towards 2050. Uh, so again, just to re reiterate, it's uh, our future emissions in the absence of any significant actions. So if things stayed relatively the same uh, with you know the, the on book kind of policy actions, we would, if you see the graph is pretty flat. So emissions stay pretty constant over time. Um, there's gains obviously in efficiency as I talked about, but unfortunately those, all those kind of gains in efficiencies are outpaced by the increase in population. So things get more, uh, more efficient, our, all of our appliances, our heating, all that stuff gets more efficient. But you know, as you add more population, you just overall the absolute amount of power needed and the absolute amount of emissions generated kind of increases to a point that the efficiencies you know get overwhelmed by just the total amount. So the actual emissions for Regina stay relatively the same from now till 2050. Um, they increase. They start at 5.3, um, mega, sorry, Greg, correct me, metric tons of, of uh, or megatons of- Megatons. Yeah, megatons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, you'll see there the big red chunk on the bottom is the industrial sector in Regina. Um, as I mentioned, there's, we have a huge, we have an oil refinery in our city boundary. So the oil refinery is a, a big, factor in those emissions. Um, transportation is the orange, another big sector. And then commercial and residential, again, the other two big ones. So all of those all stay pretty static. Um, there's dips, obviously, in commercial and in residential. But again, just the sheer volume of population growth makes them all kind of the, the, the gains net out. Um, and then if you see here, this is our energy consumption projections. 
Uh, and so here it's a bit of a different story is we actually see commercial residential actually goes up a bit. And here we actually see the, um, the industrial sector remains relatively static, but overall there's an 18% increase in the amount of emission or sorry, the amount of energy consumption projected. And, and that's just again, because of population growth. And so basically probably one, one yeah. quick point, Ryan, probably worth noting that when in that graph just jump to a head or back, I should say. Yeah. Um, when you look at municipal, that, that light pink line on the top, municipal operations only account for approximately 1.7% of the entire community emissions. And that's really why we think it's important that we take the community based approach on this. We could eliminate all emissions from the city of Regina and only reduce this by, you know, 1.7%. So uh, just to put it into perspective now, that's not to say the, the municipality shouldn't do anything and we think we should get to net zero as well, but our role really can be, I think a lot stronger as um, a leader and, you know, um, a first adopter of a lot of things as we move forward. But definitely any changes we make internally are, are really a small drop in the bucket. Um, we could affect some of the transportation numbers, but um yeah what what we do as a municipality is quite low compared to what we can do as a community yeah that's a good point like kind of our role is facilitator or collaborator or um trying to uh, push or or challenge other kind of sectors in the city is really where the where the opportunity lies because yeah as greg said it's like the tiniest sliver at the top of that graph it's barely noticeable it's still worth reducing as much as possible but definitely uh, a lot of other areas. Um, and so basically what we did is we, the Business Plan Center highlights that without further action and attention, emissions will not decrease and the city's uh, targets will not be realized. So we took that and, and we used that as our way to baseline what we needed to do um, to get to net zero and to create that pathway along from now till 2050. Um, one of the, the, the learning kind of pieces for us or, or one of the, the great aspects of this was learning that like not all targets are, are created equal. So you'll see here, there's three graphs. Um, and really at the end, you know, on the, on the x-axis all the way on the right, they all get to the same place. But if you think of like the total amount of emissions, the one on the right has the most emissions. So really that's, you know, kind of how we're seeing any real jurisdiction around the world, government, you know, anyone really, it's essentially, we're kicking the can down the road saying like, okay, like, yes, we have to do this, but we'll, we'll just kind of keep waiting uh, to make moderate changes over time. And so you really, you, you're still reducing to zero at the end of it all, but you're, you know, that whole area, the, the blue section is huge. So you still have all those cumulative uh, emissions in the atmosphere. Uh, whereas, Obviously the one on the left, the farthest one on the left there is the fewest emission. So it's the most aggressive, steepest decline. And that means you, you know, pump the least amount of emissions into the atmosphere. Um, and so the reason that matters really for us is again, recognizing that if we just keep kind of delaying and I'm really, this is what it's about is about delaying action and saying, okay, like, is this problem a 2049 problem, a 2048 problem, or is this, you know, a 2022 problem? Um, because it all kind of adds up. And, um, you know, I think even in our, our learning or in our conversations with, with people, it's, it's been really important to emphasize that notion that emissions stay in the atmosphere and they're cumulative, they compound. It's like, it's the opposite of interest in the bank. It's not the good stuff. It just stays and it keeps growing and it, it doesn't really go anywhere. So uh, what we do, and don't do today matters for the future as well. Yeah, and actually jump back this one again, Ryan, to put this into a bit of perspective without any real hard numbers on it, but on the fewest emissions on the left, that's more representative of a 1.5 degree global heating if that's global emissions. And on the far right, that's probably more representative of a five degree global warming. So you can see why it's important to understand these, but you can also see the impact of, you know, the left graph versus the right graph, um, like a five degree global warming would be, I mean, beyond what they consider catastrophic with the IPCC's uh, work.
work that they've been doing. So that's kind of why this is an important um, draft to look at. I mean, it, and to Greg's point, it also, I think it's like a really, it's a simple, relatively simple illustration, but it really kind of hammers home, especially when we're trying to, you know, talk to the community or talk to decision makers, talk to people at, that we work with, et cetera, is, is really just showing that like the, again, the, the path really does matter. Like, although you still get to the same place at the end, it, it really does matter how you get there. Um, the, the pace of change, the speed and, and the intensity. And so again, relate to what Greg said, uh, our net zero pathway that, that we, we looked at was, you know, we would say evidence-based and then we wanted to, as much as possible, align ourselves to that 1.5 to two degree warming trajectory from the IPCC and the, the, the Paris Agreement. Um, so the, the benefit obviously is that there was a few different, I guess, ways of looking at it is when we, when we were trying to look at targets, um, there's another kind of process that, that we talked about internally. And that's, if you, you'd call it maybe like a really hard line science uh, based approach. Uh, and we're, I would say maybe like the, the, the climate leaders in the world are be, would be using this kind of approach where they, where they look at like the global share of the, of the remaining amount of carbon that's, that can be put in the atmosphere to keep global warming below that 1.5 degree threshold. And they would be assigning that kind of remaining carbon budget to a city based on its population as like a percentage of the rest of the world. But they would also call a fair share approach where they would take essentially um, they would put a bigger burden on the, the, I would, you know, the, the richer countries, because historically our countries have been the ones that have done the most harm. We've pumped the most um, emissions in the atmosphere. We've benefited from all of that. And so it, it basically tries to transfer the costs onto richer nations and alleviate the pressures on um, the poorer nations. And so that would be, you know, the most aligned, hard lined uh, alignment with the 1.5 degree warming uh, pathway. But so we went with, let's say, more of an evidence informed, evidence based approach. The benefit of that is really, it, it's really focused on what's within our control. Um, I, there's, you know, as I alluded to, there's uh, some pretty big industry in our city. So part of it was trying to balance uh, necessary kind of action, but also just simply just saying like, there's only limited ability to actually move some of these numbers to zero without, without it just like I don't know, being impossible, yeah. I guess. So the, the other, ahead, the other aspect of it was working with a consultant and, and they were quite upfront with us that this was the first or second time they've ever seen this, that they couldn't model a pathway for Regina that hit a true net zero uh, or a hundred percent you know, um, net zero carbon reduction, just because some technologies aren't out there yet to, to get us there. Now, that's not to say they didn't get very close and we're not shooting for that net zero target, knowing that there will be some technology changes in the future. But um, we did need to make a few concessions along the way that net zero with current technology and current, you know, um, um, equipment out there, is just not achievable right now and we need to come up with some new ways um ryan will get to the numbers now so but not to be not to alarm anyone with that we're not going to zero we're, we're talking about like 98.5 or, or something like that is the final number so it's as close as you can possibly get without actually getting there yeah and i'm not i, I might have i might not actually have it in the slides later so it's good to bring it up and i and one of the things i talked about when we when we developed the business as planned scenario if you recall I, I emphasized that we tried to use really like known and defensible defensible uh future kind of actions like commitments from the federal government rather than let's just say like proclamations about you know future technology that would kind of save the day or whatever so um, really trying to ground it in like real reality, but then also it affords some kind of buffer that maybe things magically we do harness nuclear fusion um, and things are great or something like that. So it really realistic um, and, and conservative in that aspect. And then also, again, I don't think I mentioned it 
in the actual slideshow. So I'm glad Greg mentioned this, but when we develop, what I'll talk about next is our low carbon uh, pathway is that it was predicated. We made an, we did not build in assumptions about future technology. The, the plan that we created for Regina is, is, is grounded in, in what's actually technologically feasible today. And so um, all these kind of details matter in the sense that you'll see other plans, you'll see other cities that talk about like their plan to get to zero, but you know, let's say it relies on the last 5% buying carbon credits or the last 5% are like a kind of a placeholder for some sort of um, off, some other sort of offset. So again, it, it's kind of those details are really nuanced as like, how do you actually get to zero? It doesn't necessarily mean that the physical Geo like within that geography, every house is a net zero house and it's just so, you know, everything is perfect. It, it often means that there's a lot of carbon offsets being purchased. And again, that that's all not really proven, uh, a proven market mechanism. We don't really have a good idea how that works. So we didn't want, want to rely on, on those kind of financial tools or future, you know, technology like carbon sequestration stuff that just hasn't really shown you know, that it's, it's really viable. Um, so yeah. it, long story short, we wanted to make as realistic of a plan as possible so that it was grounded in reality. And, and to get to great, to, to bring that back to Greg's point, that meant that at the end of the day, um, we, we do have a gap and that's something that hopefully can be managed with advanced, you know, advancing technology, or if that means having to buy, credits, et cetera, later on, but really we just wanted to focus on what was doable and attainable and achievable. And it, yeah, it was also important to maintain that doable, achievable, um, just so people don't kick the can down the road and say, oh, well, we're going to have a magic technology in 10 years that solves all this for us. So we'll just wait till then. We want to be very clear, like this is based in what's actually doable and we need to follow a path of doable. Um, and if that other stuff comes into being and becomes viable that's great and then we look at implementing it and that's the plan is a dynamic plan where we can do that but we're not going to hang our our hat on this you know i, I like to call it like the magic unicorn technology that is going to save us someday because that's an awful risky proposition we thought so um we really needed to keep it based in reality yeah and so going from there there's obviously challenges the benefit is we pick something that you know was still, I mean, wildly takes Regina in a place that's, you know, uh, you know, completely transformational from where we are currently. Um, we get very, 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 very close to zero, very, very, very close to renewable. Um, the challenge obviously to that is that it's not completely aligned to best practice. We're seeing emerging, you know, a lot of cities that are doing this work or either, let's say, updating their plans to be even more aggressive. I think city of Toronto for example, is looking at 2040 to be net zero. Um, we're looking at, again, we still have that gap. We're, so it's not going to, there's obviously going to be a bunch of people that are not okay with this plan because they want it to be as aggressive as possible. Uh, so, I mean, at the same time, on the flip side, the next slide, you'll see the actual, the graphical representation, but this is still hugely transformational. So it's going to still require a huge amount of effort um, and, and will and change from the whole community. So um, it's not like we found something that was in the middle. We didn't pick the middle of the road. This is still, um, you know, yeah, really transformational. So I guess the, this is the slide here that shows where we start really in 2016. You'll see that 5.2. I think it's 5.3. This might have been an old picture. My apologies. So you'll see that 5.3 megatons at the top left. And then you'll see in 2050, that little circle on the bottom right. And so that's essentially our emissions going from 5.2 megatons all the way to 0.2 megatons. So um, I think, yeah, again, these numbers kind of fluctuated over the project. Um, so Greg, I don't know if you'd chime, if you had chimed in, but it's something like a 97% reduction in emissions. And it's important to keep in mind, these are all just projections and projecting out to 2050 to, to say we can tell within 1% of where we is probably a overstatement, but we do need to show the numbers that the model shows. So, 
Yeah. Um, again, and you'll see as, as the other the graphs that I showed from the businesses planned scenario, this is all broken down by sector. So if you recall in that original graph, the orange at the bottom was industrial. And so that was the thickest, the biggest chunk. And I mean, it, you'll see it here again too. And then obviously you'll notice that that's the one that stays thickest the longest. So that's the one that's the, the hardest to decarbonize. Again, like not to beat around the bush, but it's an oil refinery. So decarbonizing an oil refinery um, that accounts for, let's say 33%, 40% of our emissions. It kind of just shows the challenge that we're facing. Um, so the low carbon scenario generally describes a very different future than the business's plan scenario. Uh, emissions decrease roughly 98% over the 2016 baseline. Every sector is, is, ends up near or at net zero emissions and energy use is drastically decreased without you know, really sacrificing convenience or lifestyle, et cetera. The scenario is, is a way to highlight what it looks like to take advantage of the opportunities for emissions and energy use reduction in Regina. Um, again, it's not completely aligned, but it's, it's really, I would say, does a really good job at, at trying to be in line with 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 the 1.5 degree threshold. Um, you'll see at the top, this is our emissions. Um, so the top line there, the 5.4 is the businesses planned and you'll see the that slope down is the is the 0.2. So that's the, the low carbon scenario. So what we'll see next is the, the kind of the big buckets of actions that have to happen. And so if we do all those actions, that's what we'll end up causing that downward slope. And then similarly, our energy use, uh, you'll see on the bottom graph, it's, if you recall in businesses planned, it also increased about 15%. And so in here, again, a bit of a slope, basically a 50% reduction in the amount of energy that we use. Um, and so I guess the culmination of all of this is really getting to like, how is this gonna happen? Like, What, do you, what does Regina have to do to achieve the low carbon pathway? Um, what things does the community, does the organization, do, does industry, do businesses, what do they have to do to, to get to that reduction? And so we're calling, we, we've basically framed them as the seven big moves. So to reduce emissions, move towards 100% renewable energy. So there's these seven big moves that the community needs to take. They combine to limit the amount of energy use required so that it, it makes transitioning to renewable energy easier. Uh, they eliminate unnecessary energy consumption. They maximize energy efficiency. Uh, and, and then, yeah, like I said, we can bring on renewable energy um, throughout that process. So as I mentioned, if we fully implement all the actions outlined in these big moves, there would be a 52% reduction in emissions and a 24% reduction in energy use by 2030. So again, if you recall that those, those different um, graphs that had the different kind of emissions reductions, the, the really aggressive slope there. So we would end up being 50% of the way there by 2030. Um, and that's still, you know, accounting for population growth and for economic growth, et cetera. So the seven big moves you'll see on the screen, um, retrofit ex existing buildings. So uh, buildings, commercial, and residential need to be retrofitted to be as efficient as possible, energy efficient as possible. We need to switch uh, our heating fuel. So Saskatchewan obviously runs on natural gas for its heating and as a uh, fossil fuel that needs to be over time replaced with electric heat. Um, we need to adopt net zero uh, building construction so really the plan calls for all new buildings to become net zero as fast as possible. So we need to make all new buildings net zero and we need to try to make as many as possible existing buildings net zero. Uh, we need to radically increase the amount of renewable energy that's produced both you know, on, the, on the home, on the business, but also as a community. Uh, and I, you know, it's important to recognize here too that there's assumptions here that also implicate the need for our... Uh, our utility companies to also increase the amount of energy that they generate. This, the plan requires emissions-free vehicles. So that includes the city having electric transit. And that means uh, 
people switching from you know, fossil fuel based internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. Uh, the plan requires increasing active transportation and transit use. So we need to reduce the amount of people you know, having their own vehicles. And then also, you know, that big piece is the re-energized clean industry. So how can we move um, our industry away from, from one of fossil fuel, uh, um, you know, primary industry that, that's either like directly fossil fuel uh, related or, you know, supports that, like the trades and everything we need to, to transition those jobs and those industries to be more aligned with obviously the goals of the framework. Uh, and so part of all of this process involved financial modeling. So we, we did a financial model for the community as a whole. We did not do it for the organization specifically, but we essentially looked at what it would cost for the entire community. Um, the purpose of this is really to show, I think, really the opportunity more than anything, the, the opportunity of what could happen with the investments. Uh, again, just like these talking about all these models, scenarios, these are all just kind of one possible pathway. So we're not saying this has to be the only way, but we, we needed to, to show, you know, a rough idea of what, what this is going to cost people. Uh, I'm not going to get into the, the model, the key terms. If people have questions that when I talk about in the next couple slides, we can, we can get to that, but they're just kind of financial terms. Uh, but the modeling basically looked at future, future fuel prices, carbon prices, uh, projected prices of goods and technology. So, you know, the standard kind of basket of goods with inflation. Um, again, that carbon pricing, we know that the, the federal government has talked about an, an increase in carbon tax. And so again, assuming those carbon taxes on, on current energy and then into the future and then other kinds of fuel. So we looked at capital expenditures. We looked at, we did a net present value analysis, community cash flow. So really, uh, this is probably not the most interesting for a lot of people. Um, and really, the point of this was the outputs of, of really being able to see how much is it going to cost the community roughly? How much is it going to save the community? Um, what kind of job growth can we expect? What kind of economic development could we expect? And so I guess we're kind of like rounding out the presentation, I'd say, but unfortunately, while we, you know, we have, we have these numbers, like our framework, the draft of our framework was done, but you know, we're, we're not, this hasn't been released publicly. So I have TBD and all these kind of cells here on this slide to just show you what it would look like. Um, but essentially we'd have a number for the, the amount of money that it would cost to, to transition to this low carbon pathway. And then also though, we would show the energy cost savings. So eventually, and from my recollection, it's around 2030 where we break even. So a, a sizable investment is necessary in the next decade or less than a decade. But if you make that really heavy investment in the short term, you, you essentially, your break even point where you, the cost of all those initiatives starts to be less than the money you're making back or the savings. So, uh, you know, the one thing that I, Sorry, give me one sec here. The one thing that I can say is that financial modeling for, for plans across Canada and generally show that you're always going to see a, a return on your investment. So it's usually, let's say, 10, 15 years out. But um, our consultants have basically said they don't really have any examples where it doesn't become financially preferential to go down this route. Anecdotally, we know of other jurisdictions, I think even the federal government, even in their kind of in their own planning, they've come to the conclusions that by making these investments, it really just becomes a, a better payoff in the long run. Um, so our framework will also, like I mentioned, it'll talk about these costs. It'll project the amount of jobs that are could be ten, potentially be generated from, from moving through these actions. Um, and then th that kind of overall community benefit in terms of, uh, economic returns. So, I mean, there's huge opportunity. It's, it's really an economic driver. Um, and that's one, I, th I think a key takeaway, Greg could maybe talk about that a bit too, is, is that there's obviously a lot of people that without question are bought into the need to do this work from, let's say a climate perspective, or because it's like the climate emergency, climate change, we need to make this, but 
from my kind of talkings with other municipalities, in particular city of Saskatoon, it was really important to, to, to also paint a really positive picture on the economic opportunities that are available to go down this route because, you know, we are seeing insurance markets change. We're seeing investment uh, decisions changing over time. We're seeing the investment that businesses are making in certain cities, you know, they're leaving cities or they're going to cities that are more attractive. And so it was really trying to find different ways to sell this framework to different parts of the community, because, you know, although certain people are bought in 100% because of the, the, the urgency of the climate uh, situation, there's obviously people that are more concerned about the financial situation or the community benefits, et cetera. So it was really trying to find a way to tell the story to a bunch of people to get buy-in because, um, you know, municipal government, it's our council is, is 10 councillors and a mayor. So that's 11 people that all have disparate interests. So um, they're not, you know, we need to try to find a way that we can get, I don't want to say sell it to people, but we need a way to, to really show the opportunities for a bunch of different people that have different perspectives or, or represent constituents that have different um, different desires in this community. So yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there, Ryan, actually. Yeah. And you know, that that's a really great point is, you know, we've got a council and they do have different priorities. And, and I mean, that's good as a council, you don't want one council with all the same priority. Um, but this plan really does show that, you know, we're all well aware that the environmental impact of climate change is, is, you know, a huge, huge issue that needs to be resolved and we need to act quickly to do it. But what's really interesting about this plan. And I, I say that Ryan's probably sick of hearing me say this, like I started this plan off as an environmental plan and I really see it now as an economic development plan for the city of Regina. Um, the other thing Ryan didn't mention is the risk of doing nothing, right? If we do nothing, we fall behind and the cost of doing business in the city of Regina becomes astronomically higher than anywhere else uh, or any municipality who has made these moves because our energy costs are going to be so much higher. Um, we're going to be using so much more energy. It's just going to become a less desirable place to live and do business. So we really do need to transition um following a plan like this so that we maintain our competitive advantage with other municipalities as well. So, you know, and it's not, not that we need to sell it to counselors or, or anyone, or, or we're trying not to, or to sell it to the public. What we want to do is just highlight the benefits and, you know, the multitude of benefits, not just in one area that this provides and doing this work will provide so that they understand, you know, th this is not, um, this is not going to kill our economy. This is, going to work with our economy and grow our economy and, you know, really give us an advantage with economic development in the future uh, as we approach, you know, 2050 and beyond. Yeah, that's a, thanks, Greg. That's a, a good point too, is, is that, is that risk of not doing anything. So again, um, even in, without any concern for the environment, if we know the carbon tax is going to increase, that means we know that people, the cost of, of, of gasoline is going to go up. That means the cost of heating our homes is going to go up. The cost of our electricity is going to go up if the grid doesn't get more clean. So it's really also trying to uh, insulate our, you know, the city, insulate, you know, people generally from the shock of that, of that increasing cost of carbon. Uh, and making a de decision makers aware of that, you know, that it's, listen, there's a, an imperative here just for our operations. I mean, if, if carbon tax is going to go up from $50 a ton to $170 a ton, I mean, that's hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars year over year of increased fuel costs just to, to do the exact same work that you're doing, but it's going to cost you more money because, because of, of the cost of carbon. So at that point, again, it really starts to show how this kind of transition plan is really just to stay competitive. It's to just kind of keep Regina um, in a situation where we don't kind of go the way of, of like a, an old school coal town, you know, where the whole industry kind of just disappears and then you're, you're kind of a ghost town. So again, a lot of different ways to kind of to talk about this uh, that, that really get to people's priorities. So our next steps, as I, I kind of quickly went through the financials, because basically we're at a point where a lot of stuff hasn't isn't been released publicly. So we have our, our draft framework that we're going to be releasing to the public. And then that will be going to our executive committee. And then um, 
like our, our, our city council for approval. So in the, I guess, throughout March, we'll be having a number of kind of like news release, media release type events. And then at the end of March, we'll have our, our meetings with our, our counselors where this gets discussed. Um, after that, really, you know, if let's fingers crossed, it gets approved and then our implementation really begins. And um, I mean, that's also something that's kind of up in the air right now is, is internally uh, our kind of branch that we, that we, that was talked about when in the introductions, it was really created for a two-year term to kind of get this off the ground and, and get it approved. So Greg and I have home positions in the organization. So um, the city of Regina will have to kind of address that and think of how it's going to ensure success of this plan going forward. Uh, city of Saskatoon, for example, has a dedicated department to uh, implementing their, their uh, I think low emissions community plan, LEC, I think it's called for Saskatoon. Uh, and so, and then the other part there is that ongoing monitoring and reporting. So um, making sure there's a process that's set up so that year over year, we can tell that story to, to people in Regina uh, and to council. And so council can tell that story is like, how well are we doing as a community? How well are we doing as an organization? How are we tracking, you know, around the world? Uh, there's international bodies that also kind of talk about all of this work and cities disclose their performance all around the world. And so you can see kind of how other cities are doing and how you compare. Uh, and yeah, that's a really whirlwind presentation. So I yeah, and I just wanted to add to um, the the not releasing the financials and things like that right now isn't isn't us being cagey or anything like that. It is just going through the final review process with the consultant. Last thing we'd want to do is release different sets of numbers or something like that. So it's going through that final set of review. and then we'll get it to take a hard look at it so that we can understand what it it means. and speak with our organization with the different groups that are affected with potentially implementing some of these things. Um, and then it'll be released publicly um, on March 11th. And we're going to have a press conference on March 11th to really discuss the uh, any questions that the media might have. But then on the 15th in the evening, and if you, if you go to uh, Reno, uh, Regina, www.regina slash renewable, um, and if you go to our Be Heard page in there, you'll find a link to a public event, a Teams Live event on March 15th in the evening, where we're going to be going through the final report. Our consultant will be there to provide details on the report and whatnot. And then March 23rd is when we go to um, executive committee. Um, people can come and be delegates and speak to the report there. And then um, if it's recommended to pass on to council by committee, will be a committee on March 30th um, for the, the final look at the, the plan and hopefully the ultimate uh, approval of the plan so that we can get moving with, you know, the bulk of the work. Some of the work's already ongoing, like some of the stuff we know we're going to be doing. Um, so we're not, we're not sitting back and waiting, but um, well, all the work needs to be done, but some of it we need to do no matter what. Things like electrical vehicle charging infrastructure and whatnot, it's coming. So we're, we're already getting on some of that stuff really quickly. But um, once, once that's approved and we can get the staffing in place to really start delivering, that's really when things are going to start moving on this. Uh, I just threw this up on the screen there, regina.ca slash renewable. Um, I guess the one piece that I didn't mention when I talked about our engagement, we created a um, kind of a special page for this project. And if you sign up on that page, you can be kind of kept up to date with any news. So when this, all those dates that Greg mentioned, that'll all be updated on there. So uh, as I didn't have it on the screen, um, that way, yeah, if you want to be kept up to date with what's happening with Regina's plan, that'll be all available on, on our website there, regina.ca slash renewable. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop.